Hi, everybody. I'm Al Rochelle. We continue our discussions here on our website talking about uh, dysautonomias and how they are affected by other conditions. And we're going to be talking about diabetes and dysautonomia. Joining me right now is Dr. Alex Barboy. Uh, thank you for stopping by. We really appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. So let's start out by giving me a little bit of your background and how you've been involved working with dysautonomias. So I'm, a, I'm an internist and neurologist. Um, I take care of patients with autonomic disorders, mm -hmm. uh, typically as a neurologist predominantly. So I meet them um, for a diagnosis of diabetic neuropathy or diabetic autonomic neuropathy um, and try to engage in their care. Now, how long have you been doing this? Uh, it's been 15 years. And you're seeing more patients now than ever before? Uh, I am because of my subspecialty interest, yes. Yeah, so let's start out because I want to talk about the interaction between diabetes and, and, and dysautonomies, particularly any autonomic disorders. So l let's just step back for, for understanding purposes. What is diabetes and what is it caused by? So there are a few ways that one can get diabetes. One possibility is that there is a genetic underpinning. So there are genetic determinants of diabetes or family history of diabetes. Um, the other way to get diabetes is lifestyle. So um, uh, what we eat, when we eat, and how much of it uh, does play a role here. Okay. Um, and I think that is probably the second biggest um, uh, cause. Uh, there is no good one cause for diabetes yet, um, but there are some genetic syndromes where um, usually the disease manifests itself much more frequently in family members. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you can live with it, correct? And yes, it's manageable. It um, takes a lot of lifestyle changes. It's not easy, um, but it's, it's doable. <laughs> now, uh, uh, autonomic disorders, how do those interact with each other? Is, is, I'm going to ask, it's about, is it chicken and egg, which comes first, or are, what is the relationship in general? There are 86 million that live with pre-diabetes, so it's a condition that comes before diabetes, where we think they may develop it. Uh -huh. So it's a very common disorder. Uh, we think that what comes first is diabetes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of the complications in diabetes that's poorly managed uh, or not managed properly is um, uh, nerve dysfunction, or what we call neuropathy. Okay. And, uh, and that neuropathy is sometimes affecting the autonomic nerves. So what is the role then normally in the autonomic nervous system with diabetes? What, 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 would, what would the body be telling itself in terms of, of managing this? So imagine that, um, uh, imagine that um, there are little nerves that connect our brains and spinal cords to all our internal organs, and then some of those nerves don't work properly. So for instance, uh, the brain would like to control our heart rate, like mine is high now because I'm here with you. <laughs> um, but uh, perhaps uh, in, if I had a diabetic neuropathy or a diabetic autonomic neuropathy, then the, con the connection between my brain and my heart wouldn't be that well established. So my heart would be either higher than it's supposed to be mm -hmm. or too low. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be tuned up properly. When you do clinical evaluations, how does that help you make a determination whether the autonomic nervous system is involved? So it takes a little bit of uh, thinking uh, ahead of time. So first, um, um, there has to be a diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, typically, if somebody have, has had diabetes for a little bit longer, so more than five years, usually, uh, particularly if the diabetes has been poorly controlled, mm -hmm. uh, if there are other complications, so for instance, um, you know, involvement of the retinal blood vessels, we call retinopathy, uh, diabetic neuropathy, so numbness and pain in the feet, um, and um, problems with blood flow in the feet and so forth. That's when we would be thinking that perhaps it is possible that somebody may have a diabetic autonomic neuropathy. Okay. Um, and the symptoms there um, are not easy to pick up. So it's, um, it affects multiple organs, so it's difficult. So somebody may have excess um, uh, dizziness or fainting. Uh, somebody may have troubles with emptying their bladder. They may have excessive diarrhea or constipation. Uh, trouble sweating, maybe too much or not enough, mm -hmm. uh, overheating sometimes. And it takes a little bit of a detective work, so it takes a little bit of thinking outside of the box a little bit and trying to think about it way before you get to a diagnosis. We think about 60% of people that have type 2 diabetes may have a diabetic autonomic neuropathy that is not diagnosed. Oh gosh, that, that's high. So, it, it, because you're so specialized, if, if physicians are watching this right now, physicians that deal with diabetes, what tools are they going to use then to determine if, if it is in fact auto, um, attached to the autonomic system? 
so what we would have to, to do here is to, to try to think of them as a probability. So if you have uh, what I told you, and diabetes has been there for a while, there are other complications of the diabetes. It's very important to think of the possibility of a diabetic autonomic neuropathy, and clues typically typically come with inappropriate blood pressure and heart rates, um, abnormal pupillary responses when we check the pupil with a light, um, and multiple symptoms. So symptoms in multiple organs that, that the patient would bring to us. Yeah. And that's how we would have to think about it then and try to come up with a way to test for it and figure yeah. it out. So how hard is it to think outside the box? Uh, very hard for all of us <laughs> really? because yeah. we all get sort of bunched in, you know, so... Right in the middle. So it, where are we going in the future in terms of, of other doctors using these kind of procedures and in terms of, because the, uh, obviously th with so many people that have prediabetes, I mean, all the commercials are all over the place trying to remind people what to do, and yet we have this underlying condition of autonomic disorders that may have just as many people involved with that that we don't know about. True. So... Uh, we, through our testing for this disorder, can tell if the problem is a diabetic autonomic neuropathy or not. It is really important to determine that. Um, the, the way that we would prevent this from happening is early in the treatment of diabetes, very strict control of blood sugar, body uh, weight, and diet are mm -hmm. going to be helpful, tr tremendously helpful for long periods of time, to 30 to 40 years out. Oh, gosh. Importantly, though, if, there, if the diabetic autonomic neuropathy is present, the way that we tell people to manage their blood sugars and how to do this changes a little bit. And what's important is that once somebody has a diabetic autonomic neuropathy, their heart is involved. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, there, there's a higher risk for mortality. And so we absolutely have to figure that out very early so we can manage that properly. One of the things that we're trying to do with this video is for uh, general practitioners, nurses, and, and other health professionals to kind of know what signs can you give them that, that they might be able to, in quotes, think out of the box that it might be more than just diabetes. So I'd come in and say, I have persistently dry eyes and mouth. Um, I have palpitations. And you, the doctor would find a heart rate in the office that is too high, just sitting down. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have an unexplained nausea, difficulty eating, um, trouble with diarrhea or constipation. Uh, if I'm a man, I'd have erectile dysfunction. If I was a woman, I'd have excess dryness. Um, I would have um, um, uh, difficulty emptying bladder. Uh, urinary bladder. Now, each so one forth. of these are individual symptoms. Can they happen all at once? Because I'm thinking, they if you're don't. They don't. That's see, because that's the, th that's got to be the tricky part. Because some of those things that you've mentioned, uh, I have horrible dry mouth, which is why I have gum in my mouth right now. But then somebody makes the leap and go, well, it could be an autonomic disorder. So how many of these conditions on your little checklist do you go through before you say, well, now let's look at autonomics? So I think. I think uh, the context would be the patient and the, and the right setting and the, the duration of the diabetes. Uh, but I think usually if you have two, more than two organ systems involved, so if I'd come and say, well, I have dry eyes and dry mouth, but I also have unexplained diarrhea. Okay. Or I'm, you know, I have dry eyes and dry mouth and I have, you know, erectile dysfunction, right? So that would, that would flag it. Okay. That would flag it for us. Somebody should know that. Uh, last two things we're going to do. Uh, talk to doctors out there. What do they need to know specifically? Is there one important message you'd like to deliver to them? Yes, so I think that um, the, uh, the message here is that early diagnosis of treat and treatment of a diabetic autonomic neuropathy, particularly if there's cardiac involvement, is very important because it has implications into early morbidity, silent myocardial ischemia, and sudden cardiac death. So it's very important to figure it out early and manage it. Dr. Boyd, thank you so much. Appreciate I it. I appreciate it. Thank you.